Well, good morning once again. Uh, I guess in the announcement time, if you're new at Foothills uh, Bible Church, I'm to say that uh, there's free coffee for you, but you have to go through me. And so uh, after the service, uh, there'll be a closing song, and I'll be out uh, by the cafe, and, and you just come up to me and say, your sermon was one of the best I've ever heard, and then you get a, a free a cup of coffee. So just say no, welcome and glad that you're here. This is the fourth and final in a series on unity, and uh, unity is one in body and one in spirit. And the good news about uh, this is it is the last one, uh, because you've had... Uh, hey, hey, hey. Her name is Susan, just so you know. It reminds me of baseball, uh, that uh, Dan Coney was uh, number one... Uh, batter up and he gets on first or second that's what you want the batter to do and then we had Jeff Hahn one of our go workers uh, come up at second and you just hope that they uh, get on base as well or maybe even bring the first one uh, around the bases and and then you had Brad Elgin uh, last week who uh, is a, a wonderful uh, speaker a man of God and uh, deliver the word, word really well as uh, the third batter and then you have this uh, guy that is clean up and, uh, uh, and he's kind of your close, closer, and, and uh, the problem with that is a lot of those guys strike out a lot. Have you noticed that? They're trying to go for the fence, and so the only thing I want to do is, uh, truthfully, is to get on base, and we'll wait for the fifth guy to come back in August. How about that? <laughs> so growing in unity is more than just deciding that you want it. It is putting into practice everything that God instructed us in his word to be as the body of Christ. We are family. And as a family, I want us to be a healthy family, a welcoming a family, and a growing family in our relationships with each other. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my family. Uh, we're going on vacation uh, here next weekend. And we have been doing the same vacation for over 20 years. And uh, before this year, uh, we had what was like a compound, compound that we would all, there's 17 of us, go whoop, and there was a place for all of us. Uh, this year, uh, my in-laws have downsized, and uh, there's a place for about six. There's different attitudes towards that, uh, about how that's going to work. But uh, it will work because we love each other, and we get along. We have unity as uh, brothers and sisters. We're related. And as a result of that, I know it'll work. Might not be comfortable, but I know it'll work. See, I, I became a part of that family 33 years ago when I married uh, my in-law's daughter, Robin. And as a result of being part of that family, I love that family. But that's not the family I want to talk about today. There's a family of cyclists that I like to ride with. So to know me is to know I like to ride a bicycle. And I like to ride uh, long. I like to ride mountains. And I like to ride hard. And um, even my daughter said, Dad, uh, years ago, when are you going to do the Tour de France? And I said, you talking to me? I never. I ride with a, a group of people that I've been riding with for over 12 years now. And they're people that I love. I would even call them my family. But that's not the type of family I want to talk about today. The one I want to talk about is I joined this family when I was nine years old in 1969. So if you do the math, you can figure out my age. So I'm very young. And as a result of being young uh, at nine... I go to a vacation Bible school, many of you have heard the story, and I heard a simple message, and it was something like John 3.16, and it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. So God so loved the world. God so loved me is what I heard. God so loved you. Because, see, the church didn't exist then. 
when Jesus came. And Jesus, by the way, is the one saying this. He's talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a religious leader, a teacher of the law. And Jesus is amazed that he's not getting this. And he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave me, Jesus said. He didn't request. He didn't require. He gave. So God was all about the reason that he came was to give, not take. That he gave his only son and he solves this mystery of eternal life by saying eternal life is when you believe in Jesus, the Son of God. That's how you have eternal life. It's that simple. So I was like, wow, I think I can get that even as, as a nine-year-old. And so I, they wanted us to go forward. We don't have an invitation where people come forward here. And, but they wanted you to come forward to say that you wanted to put your trust in God. And I'm like, I do not want to go up there with that guy. And the next thing I knew is I was standing face to face with that guy. And as you know, I, I went back and there's another little girl in the room and, and she's crying. And I, my first question is, I thought I was doing something good. Should I be crying? And they said, no, you, you have uh, a eternal relationship with God right now at this moment. And so at that moment, I became a brother in Christ to everyone that had made that same decision around the world. And we were unified because of what? Because of my belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this earth as God, that he took all the sins of the world on the cross. He forgave all my sins. That's why he took them all. And he died, and he rose on the third day, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on my behalf, your behalf, for all eternity. Wow. That's our God. As a result of that, I am now in the family of God, the universal family of God. So there's churches all over the United States, all over the world, that are, many are meeting today. They are my brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's broadly speaking. But I'm not here today to talk about the big church. I'm here to talk about the local church, and specifically Foothills Bible Church. See, I became a part of Foothills Bible Church 31 years ago this fall. And I love this church. And I know many of you by name, but many of you I don't. One of the main reasons I say my name is Ken Kelly, and you guys obviously, many of you know, is by hopefully you would say your name back to me. <laughs> but 31 years ago, I came in not knowing anyone. And now I love this body of Christ. I'm invested in this body of Christ. And today, that's what I want to talk about is the unity that happens within the body of Christ. And how does that happen? Because, see, if we are Christ followers and we're part of this body and we've said yes to Jesus, we have a common mission, and that is to advance the kingdom of God. And for that reason alone, we should be noticeably different than the world. And you might ask, how are we noticeably different than the world? And so since you ask, if you'd open your Bibles to Ephesians 4.25, and this will be our text today, through 32. It says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt, corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for the building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. 
Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are humbled uh, to be in your presence. We're humbled because we did nothing to get this relationship with you other than accept the free gift of eternal life that is in your Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for being the head of the church, that when our focus is on you, then all other things in the church, all other people fall into their rightful place, and we truly are changed and unified. So, Lord, help us today to be focused on you, knowing that you are the reason that we're here and that we have an eternal relationship with brothers and sisters in you. And it's in your name we pray for your blessing. Amen. John MacArthur made uh, this statement a few years ago, and it says, The only reliable evidence of a person's being saved is not a past experience of receiving Christ but a present life that reflects Christ. I'll say it again. The only reliable, doesn't mean that your past experience of receiving Jesus Christ didn't happen, but if you want some reliable evidence of being saved, is that your present life reflects Christ. Ouch, that hurts. Does that hurt anyone else? Today, is your life reflecting Christ? Today, is the church, when it comes together, reflecting Christ? Is your life, when you go out into the world, and someone said it this way, and they put you on trial, and they start asking you questions about your faith, would they find you guilty of being a Christian? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. The old has passed away. The old nature has passed away. Has it? The new has come. Has it? There's a song I I like a lot about, uh, it's actually about a girl. And and it's a cool song, but I like it about the old nature. And it's, it's a song that, basically says, gone. Gone like a freight train. Gone like yesterday. Gone like a soldier in the Civil War. Bang, bang. So the old nature, I would sing it, but it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. So the old nature is gone. It, and it's never to return. It's been replaced, not added to, by the new nature. So if you're a believer in Christ, you have this new nature. And the Holy Spirit has come in your life. The moment you said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit came in your life, circumcised your heart, and you became a child of God, never to be undone. So in that moment, the Holy Spirit came never to leave you nor forsake you. You will forever have the Holy Spirit in your life. So how do we get this gone thing and yet still struggle with it? So Paul gives us some very practical ways that show us that uh, we've changed or we should have changed. So the new nature, in theory, has gone. Theologically, the new nature is gone. But I wake up, I mean the old nature, the old nature is gone. I wake up every morning to that old nature. It still shows up. It still knocks on my door saying, Ken, have your way. And the first way I know that as a fact is that I struggle every day with God having his way. And today I hope to keep my job after a few examples that I'll give you. But the first way that Paul says is that we are to get rid of falsehood. And that is not the Christian life. That's not the Christian life new way any longer is to lie. And when someone lies, I I like to say that they are are fibbing. And so, but fibbing doesn't really say that what it really is. It's a lie. But I would like to make friends and influence people. 
And so as a result, I just call them fibbers. But they know what they are. And so, uh, but when you are not telling the truth, that's not the Christian way. That's not the new way. That's not putting on Christ. We are to be about the truth. And it's the truth that not only sets us free, but it's the truth is what the body of Christ needs. We are about reality. Lies are not about reality. Falsehoods are not about, the real, about reality. I was on a bike ride, go figure, uh, a week or so ago, and I was wearing a jersey from a, a year ago, and it's called the Triple Bypass. And every time I'm feeling arrogant and prideful, I like to put on this jersey, because it, it has a mountain that you go over, and then another mountain you go over, and another. So it's kind of a show-off moment, and so I like to wear that. And especially in this season where I'm feeling like I'm a little bit out of shape, and, and I'm riding uh, pretty much by myself on this particular day. And some uh, man comes up and, and behind me and, and rides beside me and says, all right, well, the, you know, the triple bypass is tomorrow. Good luck on that. <laughs> and I said, thank you, thank you. Well, I was not going to ride that triple bypass that next day. But he had every reason to believe that's falsehood, that I was going to ride that. And so it just ate at me all the way up the mountain. As I was going up Lookout Mountain, I'm like, I hope I see that guy again. I'll just tell him the truth. And God says, really? You will? So up he comes right beside me. <laughs> now we're at the top. And he says, uh, so what time are you leaving tomorrow morning? And I said, I typically leave around 5 o'clock. I didn't say I was going to write. I said I typically leave around five. Falsehood. You see, here, here is a, a, a pastor uh, trying and striving uh, to be honest. And here I am in a circumstance that that old man comes out. And I'm wanting to look good and I'm wanting to sound good. And, and I want people to put me in a good light. And so I say what they want to hear. And it wouldn't have been any trouble saying, I'm not riding it this year. And so he doesn't know whether I was riding it or not. I think he thinks I was riding it, and I don't know him at all. I'll probably never see him again. Now that I say that, I'll probably see him tomorrow. <laughs> see, see, we wrestle uh, with the truth. And uh, dishonesty within the church and with brothers and sisters in Christ destroys the church. To be a unified church, we need to be honest. We need to be honest with one another. When someone's saying something that's not true, and we know it's not true, we need to call them on that, but it's speaking the truth in love. And the reason that I go to that person and I speak that is not for me, it's for that person. And it's to bring back unity within the church. The other is uh, that we are... Uh, not to have uh, this anger that is unrighteous, but to have a righteous anger. And I, I struggle a little bit with this because uh, the scripture says, be angry, but do not sin. So some of you came in today going, yes, I can be angry. But it says, be angry and do not sin. And, and again, we're talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about everyone in this room, about Foothills Bible Church about people, it starts here, that we are not to be angry with and not to let the sun go down on our anger. Years ago, I, I, when we were first married, Robin and I, uh, we took that literally. And so when we had three or four problems and we were extremely mad at each other, uh, we would just continue to work on that, not letting the sun go down on your anger. It would be two in the morning, and we're still... Not good. And I'm like, I know it says in the Bible, not let the sun go down on your anger, but I got to be at work at 6 o'clock, so I got to go to bed. And, and so that's not what Scripture means. What Scripture means is that there is a deadline for your anger, and the deadline is that you, you have to let it go. You have to own the responsibility of 
not being angry with the other person and letting the sun go, go down on your anger. Because the unrighteous anger is all about self. And this is about me. And it's vindictive and it's self-serving, that kind of anger. And it's not very disciplined. And we see uh, a lot of people with that kind of anger. And there's bitterness that's there. There's hatred many times for the other person, at least in the moment. And there's a way of saying, I want some revenge for that, what they've done to me. Because they've hurt me. That's what anger does. It hurts you. And righteous anger is selfless. Uh, Wilberforce is a, a good person to think about the righteous anger. And, and it's based on uh, love and concern for other people. And during the slave trade, he was furious that people could enslave other people. And he fought for their freedom. That's a righteous anger. And it actually does something for someone else. Jesus was angry many times in Scripture. One is Mark 3, 5. It says, And he looked around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, and it was restored. See, the religious leaders said, Today is the Sabbath. And you are not to heal anyone. You're not to do any work on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, watch this. But he was angry at them because of their hardness of heart. It was a righteous, it was a good anger. So we can be angry and not sin. And the reason is we don't want the devil to get a foothold in our life. And what that means is it's a staging ground. It's a, an opportunity for him to come into our lives and set up office. Anger does that. It allows him to say, oh, I just need a little opportunity. Would you just let me in just a little bit? Open that door just a little bit. And as a result, he'll take over. And the Bible's clear is don't allow that to happen. Before the sun goes down, time limit. And before anything can build up in your heart against the other person, let it go. We don't know what the other person's going to do. But our job is to let it go. The more we postpone uh, mending a quarrel, the less likely we are to mend that. You need to go to that person and say, I'm good. The longer that we let it go, the more that flourishes in our life. And the more, as a result, th those words that come out that are hurtful, and terrible, they're just waiting. And that's the enemy that's ready to do that. So when we're wronged, what we want to do is have the grace to humble and to admit that we were wrong. When we've been wrong, that we have the grace to put it right. And that takes God. That takes the Holy Spirit. That is not natural, as Brad Elgin said last week. That is unnatural to let it go so quickly and not be angry. But it's healing and it's helpful. It goes on to say, don't steal. It says, uh, no more thieving. And, uh, and instead, share with those who are in need. That we work, this is a weird concept and in, in passage, that we work to give away. We don't work to amass things. We work to give to someone else. Just recently, uh, my wife and I decided to create a fund called Joyful Giving. And it's not like we have a lot of money. And in fact, I'm a little uh, not joyful about the Joyful Giving Fund. <laughs> and, and the reason is, is, is kind of the extra stuff. You know, we already have the percent and all that stuff that we, we give. And supporting other people, but this is a different kind of fun, and, and Brian and uh, Mary Ellen Kluth uh, actually shared this with us and, and said it's so much fun to give joyfully. And so anything extra come in, you give a percentage of that, and, and it's amazing how that fun adds up. And you might say, well, what's that have to do with thieving? Well, I'm getting to the point. And so uh, 
over time, that fund actually got pretty substantial at one point. And, and this was in a season where my brother was really sick. And we were very budget conscious people. And, uh, and I saw the Joyful Giving Fund and, and I needed to get a flight out. And I asked um, the boss if it was okay if I could uh, borrow from the Joyful Giving Fund. And she goes, that's not our money. That fund is for someone else. We both agreed that is not our money. And I'm like, but I want to go, and that money's there, and, and we don't do the credit card thing. And uh, No, we're not. And this was on a Sunday morning, and, and uh, she goes, isn't that exciting, though? I said, well, what's exciting? To watch how God's going to come through. Come through how? You know, and I didn't know if he'd make it the next day, and I wanted to get out as soon as I could. And, and, and Robin is, is this faith lady, and, and here's the pastor going, I don't think he's going to come through. <laughs> and I guess I'll just wait until the funeral and go out then. And, and uh, I know we can afford at least one flight because it's kind of the next day type stuff. And we get to church, and Robin sits beside someone that she hasn't sat with in church ever. She said, how is Ken doing? And she goes, oh, he's doing all right, but, you know, is he going to go out and, and, and cut to the chase? Basically said, well, he's going to wait until, you know, he passes. And they said, no, he needs to go now. And, and they said, well, it's the flight and all this. And they said, well, we have all this extra miles, and he can go tonight, today if he wants. What? So I'm flying out the next morning at 8 o'clock, and I had a whole week uh, with my brother that I didn't think I'd get. And I didn't have to steal from the Joyful Giving Fund. <laughs> you see? God had a better plan for me. And he wanted me to go that plan. He wanted a double blessing. See, the Joyful Giving Fund is for us to bless someone. And the person that came into our lives was able to bless us. And both are from God. God wants to work through us, and this is both all the body of Christ, that this happened. So much so that I went back a second time, and they said, let us know when you go back. And I, I, I journaled all of this at the time, and, and uh, I'm on the plane, and, and right before I get on the plane, um, I said, there must be some mistake. You know, my seat's right here, and they had put me in first class. I've never been in first class. It's kind of cool. I mean, really. <laughs> I could get used to that. But that's God. I, I, I wouldn't have used the joyful giving fund for first class. I would have used it for, you know, coach. But, but God had his plan for me. And he says, no more of that. No more of this uh, taking what is not yours. And instead, when you get, go and help someone in need with that. The other way is that we have this changed life within the church that, that will make a difference with our unity is that we don't use unwholesome words, but wholesome words. The idea of that is um, words matter. There's a parenting class that Rob and I like to teach, and, and it, it goes something like this when you're talking to your kids, and, and it says, uh, mean what you say, say what you mean, and do what you say you're going to do. So make sure you mean what you say. If you don't mean what you say, it makes you out to be a liar or a fibber. I, I'm about winning friends and influencing people. So, uh, but no, you, you're not telling the truth. No. When you say something that needs to be said, speaking the truth in love, that you mean it. And then you do what you say you're going to do. James in James 3, 6 through 8, it says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members. That's us. Staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire, how? By hell itself. For every kind of beast and bird a reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. Bummer. It is a restless evil 
full of deadly poison. Psalm 141, 3 says, Set a guard, O mouth, over, O, o Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. That is wholesome words. Those are pure words. Those are words that are a gift. Those are words that are healing, that build up, that encourage. That's what Paul wants us to be about. And if you, my mom said this, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's what that passage is about. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned, with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That is seasoned with salt. Proverbs 15, 23 says, To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. So no more foul mouth, but those words that are helpful. I have a lot of... Uh, adventures at Club USA and one of these adventures that I have is uh, someone that was in the spin class that kept using the Lord's name in vain and uh, over and over and over again and I'm just like hey, stop it already and but I didn't know him and it was, it was a new relationship and so I'm trying to be patient and I've got my own stuff I'm working on and it's not that and so I I, I'm listening, and, and he's saying again, so I'm trying to avoid this guy, but the more I avoid him, the more that God brings him in my life, and he wants to ride bicycles with us, and he wants to do the bicycle tour, and he wants to do the triple bypass, and, and maybe we can have a couple of extra days up in Steamboat, and, and so, of course, we do all that, and, and all of us uh, and our wives uh, join us, and, and he's still doing the bad language thing, and I'm like, Ey. and he says, you're a pastor, right? And I said, yeah. He said, Foothills Bible Church? I said, yeah. Well, I became born again at Foothills Bible Church in the 70s. And I said, born, really, you're born again? And he probably was using bad words that whole time he was explaining the story. And I was shaking my head and can't believe it. And, but I'm keeping it in. And, and I'm not saying anything. And some time passes, and another good friend of ours who's riding with us uh, confronts confronts him and, and says, dude, you said you're a Christian. What's the deal with the foul language? And he goes, what, what foul language? What are you talking about? He says, he had used it so much he didn't even recognize he was using it. So he finds me and says, Pastor Ken, why didn't you ever he say anything about my foul language? And I'm like, I don't know. And I went in my head between you. Know, just walked away. Because I, I was wrong. And I should have come clean. So we're to be those people that are taming the tongue. And it's impossible to tame the tongue. And in fact, grieving the Holy Spirit in this passage is a lot about taming the tongue. That we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit, but we're to please God. See, when we... Uh, let our mouth run crazy, it doesn't honor God and it grieves the Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit is a person. Say, what? Yeah, the Holy Spirit is God in three persons. You have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. And you can hurt and grieve the Holy Spirit by your actions, by what you say that is hurtful or damaging or is not honoring to God. And so what happens with the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is our guide. It's our seal to know that we're a child of God. See, I, I blow it on a regular basis. But as, as when I'm, when I'm on, down on myself and other people have confronted me with some things that I should do better, I feel bad about it. That's good. Because you have the Holy Spirit and you don't walk perfectly and you feel bad about it when you do blow it, it's part of being a human being. It's a part of striving to honor God with your life. You know, there, I, I don't, I, if you're a little kid, you might plug your ears because I'm here to tell you there's no Superman. There's no Batman. There's no Spider-Man. 
There's no Iron Man. What? No, they don't exist. They're someone's imagination. We will not be those people. There's only one man that will help us, and that is the Holy Spirit. God, God, man, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God that lives and dwells in me, in you, if you're a child of God. And he helps us be obedient. He helps us say the right things to brothers and sisters in Christ. And it says that we are to get rid of these things called bitterness and rage and anger and clamor. That's kind of out loud uh, and embarrassing moments in public that we have lost self-control and everyone knows it. The slander of putting other people down. And many times when they're not around. And malice, which is every form of all of these put together and more. And it says that we are not to be these people. And I see it as almost impossible that I'm not going to be one of those people in private or in my own heart that's not putting people down and giving them a hard time. When I was uh, young married again, I like to go way back so I look a little more godly today. But uh, uh, about the first or second year of marriage, uh, I came from a family of eight. And, and when you're from a family of eight, you go, pass the salt! And, you know, I'll have that last biscuit. So you're always yelling. And uh, I married into a family that they don't yell at all. And so uh, Rob and I are having a disagreement in our first or second year of marriage. And, and I'm talking kind of like this, and I'm really upset. And she goes, well, just stop yelling. And I go, that is not yelling. <laughs> this is yelling. <laughs> and, of course, it didn't go well for me. So that was the second year of marriage, and, and uh, we waited about five years before our daughter was born. And, and so she didn't experience yelling in our home. Because when I would raise my voice, it does something to Robin where she shuts down and she can't hear me anymore. And one thing we like to be is heard, and we think that people are going to hear us the louder we speak. Actually, Robin is the opposite. The softer I speak, the more she goes, huh, what'd you say? She hears me. And so we... Uh, pretty much perfected that in the early years. We're not completely perfect today in that area. But uh, our five-year-old daughter at the time, Catherine, uh, wasn't exposed to yelling in the home. And she is next door playing with the next-door neighbor's kids. And, and uh, she comes running back uh, over through the front yard. And chasing her is the uh, lady that lives next door, running after her. And she runs, and so we're at the door, happened to be at the door, and she runs and hides behind Robin, and, and the lady's there, and she goes, she's mad at me, she's yelling at me. And she goes, I yell at everybody. <laughs> and the point is, Catherine wasn't used to yelling. And somehow God had taken that in a, in a miraculous way out of our marriage, out of our life. And so Catherine when she was exposed to it for one of the first times in her life, was scared because that anger was coming out in the yelling and, and it was making her uneasy and she wanted to get away from it. And that's what angry people do. And that's what people that are bitter and they have this uh, strife in their lives and they, they have this rage and they don't even see it in themselves many times. And it's in the church and I see it regularly in the church because I'm here most every day. So what are we to replace it with? It says to get rid of it, but replace it with kindness, uh, with compassion, being tender-hearted, with forgiveness. So we have extremes. We have the extreme of I am ex I'm angry, I'm bitter, I, I'm full of rage, and in that very moment, to replace it with being kind. What? And compassionate. Putting yourselves in the other person's shoes. That they're more important than you are in this moment, even though you're feeling that way. And that you are forgiving. See, the, the, the law of personal relationships is treating others as Christ 
has treated you? How has Christ treated you? He he forgave you. Boy, that's big. And forgiveness is not natural. It's very unnatural. I always say it's not normal, it's abnormal or abnormal. And the more abnormal we are, the more like Christ we are instead of like the world. And God calls us to forgive, but you don't understand they hurt me. I know they've hurt you. I've been hurt, but we are to forgive. And this passage on forgiveness is much like uh, the, the forgiveness of a pardon. It says, forgive as Christ has forgiven you. It, it, it's a pardon. And again, a pardon means that you are guilty when you hurt me. And I'm saying you don't have to pay for it. You're forgiven. See, what Christ did for me is he forgave me. He forgave me of all my sin. And he doesn't count that sin against me in the present moment, any sin, or in the future relationship with him. That sin has been forgiven. Wow, that's our God. All sin has been forgiven. So if Christ can forgive all my sin, and he never sinned at all, why can't I forgive someone else's sin? And many times it may be someone who's hurt you in the past, and maybe not even have been in the church, could have been in the church. The church could have hurt you in some way in the past. Or someone didn't give you that job you thought you deserved. Or they lied about their credentials. Or they lied and you didn't get that loan. Or they said that you would get that loan, but you didn't get the loan. I'll never forgive them. Someone said something that wasn't true about you. See, they're guilty. And God asks us, no, he tells us to forgive. See, if you're not a Christian, you're off the hook. But as Christians, as we've been forgiven, we've received that forgiveness. We're to forgive other people just as Christ forgave us. See, it it won't mean that we won't be reminded of that. Many times I see people that remind me of what they did to me. But it doesn't define me of who I am in my walk with God. I can't carry this past into the present. I like to say that the future is eight lanes north, and it's with God. And it's a clean slate, and it started this morning when I woke up. And I turn around, that's the past. I'm not going that way. I'm going this way, north with God. And the best way to get there is to forgive. And that forgiveness is for you. Probably the hardest thing that you'll ever do. There's a man by the name of Andy Stanley, and he uh, is a pastor of a very large church. And he was giving a talk on this once, and, and what he said is that those who have hurt you deeply, and you say, well, you know, Pastor Ken, I, I've forgiven them. I got on my knees, and I said, God, help me to forgive them, and I forgave them. And they, you still hurt, and you're still angry, and, and that's starting to build up. And, and he, he gave a great uh, idea, and he said, go, go and uh, get a piece of paper and write on that piece of paper how they hurt you. And write out in detail every way that they hurt you, how they robbed you, how you didn't sleep for a month, and how that first marriage and second marriage didn't work because of you. And... And that list will go on and on. And he said, you'll be amazed how how long that list will be for that one person for that one sin. Because of how deeply it hurt you and and probably didn't let the sun go down on that anger. And now it's a part of your life. And you're bringing that into your future. Because we have a future that has a lot of hope. We have a present that has a lot of hope. But if we bring that past in there, It starts defining the moment. We can't enjoy it in the way that God wants us to enjoy it. We have to let it go. And we have to 
move on, especially within the church. These are people, right or wrong, that you're going to be with forever. And we won't get it right perfectly today. Unity is hard work. Letting go of hurt is hard work. But man, when you do that, it reminds me of uh, a man in Russia who's by, by the road, and he's got this heavy bag, and it's got all his cares and worries and anger and bitterness and resentment, and, and he's got it, and it's beside the road, and it's just weighing him down, and, and this wagon comes by and, and says, Comrade, take, take a load off, you know, jump on the wagon and, and rest. And, and they go on down the road, and he turns around, and, and the man's still there holding the sack. And, and when they stop, he gets off, and, and, and the wagon goes on, and he still has all of these burdens that he's carried. And God says, I'm the driver of the wagon. I'm allowing you to come, not to grieve me, but to come and sit on this wagon and take that burden and dump it out at the foot of the cross. And when we pause, because you've got to go out and live life, you can start with a clean slate because you know what? You can keep all of that yuck on the wagon and I'll take care of it because I'm a good God and you can trust me. And then, as a result, we find that we have this yuck that is gone. And people hear of our yuck that is in our life. And they didn't know we had a yuck. In fact, they say, well, you know, Ken Kelly seems like he, he has a pep in his step. He seems like he can move on. No, I have yuck. Just like anybody else. But I unloaded that bag and God took it. He says, my burden is easy. It, my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Cast your cares on me, for I care for you. So when I've unloaded it all on God, it's in good hands, and I can move on. So when we don't forgive, we don't have that experience with God. We don't have that forgiveness ourselves in the experience that we have because we're grieving the Holy Spirit. And we need to do that for our brothers because God did it for us. So, at the end of the day, living a changed life is not just knowing what is the right thing to do. Living a changed life is doing the right thing. See, it's not enough just to decide to do the right thing. You need to do the right thing. That brings unity. The first decision as Brad Elgin said last week, is deciding that I want to be unnatural, abnormal, not like the world. That's the first step. But the really knowing that you are different and that we're going to be different is by doing it. And that will make all the difference. And how we do that is we surrender our life to Christ. and We surrender our life to God's will, not our will. And when that happens, we hit the big idea. And that is Christians that live a changed life will not only bring unity to the church, but will change the world. So when we're living this changed life, allowing God to have his way will not only bring unity here, but will change our world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message of hope that we have, that we can be different, that we can change, that we know that the sinful nature is gone, but it t tends to return every day to uh, do battle with us. And we know without uh, your help, Holy Spirit, that we uh, cannot have victory. So we ask that we would be obedient to you. And when we're obedient to you, that we uh, will uh, collide with your faithfulness. We will see it in all the ways that we didn't when we had it our way. So Lord, help us to um, 
do what's right. Help us to uh, make a decision that uh, when we make it, we'll be caught uh, doing what's right instead of what's wrong. And Lord, uh, it will bring glory to you, bring uh, praise to you, and uh, unify your church. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.